My name is Tristia Bauman. I will be moderating this session on criminalization of vehicle residency. And uh, we've got a number of different kind of big picture topics that I'd like to you know, lift up. And the title of the discussion hits on them. But um, I'd like to, if it's okay with this group, I mean, I think this group will decide essentially the content of this conversation. But I, I would tend to think that we're pretty familiar with some of the harms of criminalization. And I'm also going to operate under an understanding that we now are all going to be using the phrase criminalization to not just mean narrowly criminal penalties for vehicle residency, but all uses of law and law enforcement to displace, dispossess people of property, segregate, and otherwise penalize people for living in their vehicles. And so, uh, you know, let's use that big, big, um, broad definition of criminalization for purposes of this conversation. And if we can all, can we all agree on that? Is that something, you know, criminalization and the harms, that's not where we want to focus our time. What we'd really like to talk about are advocacy strategies and solutions. How do we get to where we want to go um, and push back on this rising tide of criminalization? I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, that's where that's where I'd like to um, have our conversation focus. And if we're agreed on that as a starting point, we can go ahead and start with some of the hands that were raised. Now, Jake put his hand back down, but Jake was first. And so I'll call on Jake. Thank you. Um, I want to jump in with a big suggestion that I want to shout out to the world. How about instead of criminalizing people, we offer them a solution? I feel like every locality whether it be a small town or a big city, before punishing people, offer them a solution that works in their vehicles. For example, defining a space in town or in the county where they can live in their vehicles uh, short term or long term. I, that, from that point, it gets complicated. But why can't we shout that to the whole world and get Jake, uh, you went on mute at the very tail end of your comment, but I think we heard what you uh, were saying about why can't we focus on solutions? You know, why is that not uh, what communities are oriented around? And solutions um, for purposes of vehicle residency means solutions that allow at least as an option for people to remain in their vehicles if that is something that they choose. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I know that Ruth raised her hand before Jake asked this question, but I'm going to, uh, you know, for purposes of facilitating a conversation, go to Ruth and see if you have any uh, response to Jake. And Ruth, you're on, you're on mute. Yes, Jake, I totally agree. <laughs> um, so I raised my hand because uh, tomorrow, our city council is trying to pass an ordinance uh, which will push people to the perimeter of the community. And our, our local vehicle residents have said, let us organize a campground. We'll take care of it. <laughs> so that's my idea for a solution. Um, but I was wondering, um, by raising my hand, so I plan to go to the city council meeting tomorrow and speak. So you know, we get three minutes. Um, I think I'll focus because I'm a nurse on uh, health repercussions of um, force dislocation, and um, but I just wondered, you know, if you if you had if anybody had like a don't forget to say this or <laughs> any particular last minute they're trying to rush through this ordinance because of tourist season, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that is a, um, a really helpful response. So, you know, a solution that goes to Jake's question is for people to have a self-organized location where they can um, they can park and manage the um, the living environment for people living in vehicles. And, you know, Ruth, I think your particular background is one where raising some of the public health benefits of that type of approach, especially as compared with another approach of 
segregating people to the outskirts of town where they're, I'm going to guess, more likely to be disconnected from the things that people need um, in order to remain healthy and stable and safe, like adequate lighting, access to water, access to toilets, um, and any number of other access to, to community uh, services. Um, I think uh, transportation, uh, any number of, of things I think uh, is are good arguments to make. In my experience, I don't think that there is any set of magic words. And part of the reason I believe that, and this is going to come off as cynical, though maybe this group won't consider it too cynical. Uh, I think that there are um, discriminatory political forces at play where the rational arguments that we make about why criminalization policies are expensive, ineffective, and harmful fall on deaf ears because they're not trying to solve for that problem. I think governments are trying to solve for the problem of complaints um, and being able to address the complaints that they receive from the public about people who are in public space that they don't want to see in public space. Uh, Betsy, you also raised your hand before um, before this part of the conversation came around, but I'd like to turn to you and see if you have any thoughts about um, what we're discussing or if there's um, another issue that you want to raise. I'm happy to wait till others speak. But since you've invited me, I will say, actually, I very much would like to follow up. It's been really, it's taken me probably 10 years, eight years of advocacy and poking around and trying to understand why so many good ideas just fell on deaf ears or petered out. One, of course, is that the people who believe most in alternatives need to build up the confidence and the, and the relationships to speak for those. But I also want to say that I've discovered here in Alameda County, and I don't think it's limited to us, but there is an active set of recall campaigns for three women of color who were elected leaders, and they're being accused by money from several industries, but let's call it property association, property owners, landlords, and realtors realtors associations, a particular political arm, and they use soft on crime and they're going to take your property. They use a number of tactics that reinforce, that basically scare scare homeowners, voters, and try to get them. Uh, they don't want to hear solutions because they've already been taught misinformation by this combination of very, very well-moneyed uh, they call them dark money political action committees and the California realtors, you know, it's kind of, it, it's our deeply implicit in this statewide, but here in Alameda County, you know, it's a small group putting a lot of money. And I believe the reason is not just, so it's the DA for the County. It's the mayor of Oakland, our largest city. And recently like Within a couple of weeks, our state senator who supported a bill for social housing, and they're accusing her of soft on crime. They're not deliberately talking about the housing side, but you know, it's it's a whole. If we're looking big tent, you know what we do with rent control, what we do with uh, creating a variety of affordable housing communities, is also plugged into. Uh, what what is what who are the unhoused why are they there everyone should have to pay rent and property taxes right so I I just there's a lot there I won't go any further but I am wondering if others have seen this pattern of financing of anti-democratic you know uh, either recall campaigns or um insulting and undermining candidates who would be more helpful for folks living in vehicles. So thank you for letting me share that. I'm not just paranoid, I promise. <laughs> I believe you, Betsy. And I'm guessing a lot of people here um, have had similar experiences. So, you know, a couple of um, issues that I, I want to lift up. One, uh, Betsy talked about the um, political nature of policymaking in this space um, and 
issues related to housing and vehicle residency and what we might more traditionally think of as being unhoused are inherently political. Um, and there are political forces that are leveraging the um, arguments to spread fear um, through disinformation and uh, use it as a political football for purposes of putting people that they want in power into uh, positions of power. I, I am um, saying that based on experience. I don't you know, expect everyone to agree with me. Um, and there are instances where perhaps I'm wrong, but that does seem to be you know, a common theme uh, that I have witnessed. And, and Betsy asked if, if others have seen that same thing. Uh, I see that Ruth has her hand up again. And because we've heard from Ruth, I, I'll, I'll pause really quickly. I will come to you, Ruth. Anybody else you know, have the experience of witnessing what appears um, to very uh, transparently be uh, a political um, battle when the discussion is about the real needs of uh, vehicle residents and perhaps dark money and deliberate efforts to spread disinformation about vehicle residents to support criminalization policies. Has anyone had that experience? Peggy, is, is your hand raised? It's It says check. Yeah, why don't I go uh, Peggy and then Ruth? In um, the west side of Los Angeles, our city council person got a huge amount of funding from law enforcement foundation and uh, real estate. So, of course, it's a problem because the people who get all this money to get elected and then they that's their you know, they think that's what they're supposed to do. And they do have a certain amount of following because of the gentrification. So I agree, it's a problem. I don't see, it's really hard to organize people when you've got the massive amount of funding against you from say real estate developers or law enforcement. So I, you know, plus, you know, the cops have guns. So it's hard, I agree. Ruth. Oh, I just wanted to say that, yeah, I, I uh, wish I know, I'm bad with names, but absolutely like at our city council meetings, as I understand it, that um, many people are coming out in opposition to speak against this ordinance and nobody, or at least not very many people are coming out to speak for it. So it definitely kind of sounds like what, yeah, I'm suspicious of, you know, of what, when she was talking about it's I don't I don't really and it's hard to understand who's for it we're not seeing them but um also I just wanted to maybe put in the chat the policy statement for the American Public Health Association because of a lot of times public health concerns are cited to support criminalization and that's not the intent of the American Public Health Association so I think they speak directly to that here that we should provide resources for people, not force them to the peripheral periphery of society. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so, you know, a, a few things. We started with, you know, why can't we pursue solutions? And Ruth, you pointed out there's a, you know, a community driven solution that is um, before them as they consider policy alternatives, whether to uh, push people to outskirts or to develop a, uh, you know, a a location where people can uh, can live in a self-managed way. Uh, there is always value, despite the cynicism, um, my view is that there's always value in making the true policy case. This is going to improve public health. Here's what the American Medical Association, the CDC, this is what experts have said, um, including, you know, um, in your case, Ruth, I am saying as a, as a health professional, what will improve public health um, and why we're making the recommendation. I think other types of arguments that can be compelling when you're making the true policy argument are costs. Um, it is uh, somewhat difficult, but through public records, you can show that the cost of enforcement of criminalization policies far exceeds the cost of uh, providing supportive services, especially as those services um, look more and more like 
permanent locations where people can stably be something that you know is permanent housing or that approximates permanent housing so that's a, you know another argument that can can be made um but we know that because this is an inherently political decision where there is a lot of moneyed interests that oppose the uh, solutions that are being formed by the community, that we need advocacy strategies that um, can overcome those powerful forces. And uh, I, I recall that I was once told, um, you know, people with money purchase power, uh, people without money organize for power. So, you know, I'd like to, you know, transition to talk about how we, as the less moneyed interests, can overwhelm the more um, moneyed and powerful interests through strategies like organizing. Has anyone here had uh, experience with organizing? And I know some of you have, and so I, I'll try not to call on people, but I would encourage folks to, to raise their hands. But a quick show of hands. Who's who's had any experience with organizing opposition to criminalization policies? Okay, I probably should have warned you first, but everybody who's identified themselves, I'm gonna <laughs> you, you risk being called on because I want to make sure that we're all uh, all engaged. And I saw a few hands go up, so I'd like to um, call out folks that I'd like to go to, starting first with Cappy. Yeah, we have two groups in our city. One's uh, Ventura City Social Service Task Force that we deal with mostly homelessness, not so much vehicles, although it is one component. Uh, let me go back and get my picture up there. Um, and then we have another group that's called Homes for All, which we advocate for housing. Um, and we work together to um, often... Um, speak to city council when there's a housing or a homelessness issue coming forward we, whenever we can. So it won't help right now, but uh, in your city, if you can get a coalition of people going, one of them is a faith-based one. The Social Service Task Force has a faith-based subcommittee, but then also we have uh, other people too. And unions, surprisingly, there's been a couple times, particularly with housing that unions, teachers unions, carpenters, electricians have come forward and talked about um, how they need housing. It's not vehicles, but um, it, they could talk about it. And then during pandemic, we had a lot of nurses and doctors that lived at the hospital in their RVs. So that's an example of when it can be useful. Be, they can't do it now, but they could then, So, which is unfortunate. Yeah, Kathy, you're talking about, you know, different labor unions, uh, people mm -hmm. in the health care industry who may be natural allies, the faith community who may be allies. Teachers. Teachers as well. Um, the uh, type of um, connection is something I'm, I'm interested in, right? So you've named some groups that could be um, enlisted for purposes of large mobilization and organizing. But what are the spaces where people are connecting? Is it that you just all happen to be showing up at city city council hearings and you exchange numbers or, you know, what, what's, what does it look like? No, we have a coalition of, um, in the city of Ventura, of uh, faith groups, um, social service groups, their uh, school district, homeless advocate, the mental health advocate, the different advocates. And we meet once a month. Not everybody shows up all the time, but we meet once a, once a month. And then um, that particular group, we will and cause coastal. Uh, it's mostly with low income, um, Hispanic and mixed tech, mixed tech and uh you know, groups that um, are low income housing for those folks. So it's more housing, but it is, but we do, we are working on vehicles also um, as sort of a secondary level project and dump stations. Don't Thank let you, me Kathy. get started. 
<laughs> Thank you, Kathy. And I'd like to, you know, stay with this topic, you know, the, the tactics um, to build coalition and organize before moving to some of the questions that have popped up in the chat. And I'll call on some of the folks that I saw raise hands, starting with uh, Thomasina. And you can always tell me, no, 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 I'm not. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I was just looking for the, the mute. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the organizing part is probably the hardest thing here in Squam. I'm, I live in Canada in Squamish. Um, we have a group called the BRS, the Beagle Residents of Squamish, and it's pretty basically just me and a couple other burnt out people. But um, in terms of organizing, we've definitely like went to every council meeting that they've had regarding the bylaw. We've pushed back, like we've had people show up. We've had like 150 people show up at the very first one, but the unfortunate thing is people get burnt out and they don't come anymore when we need them. Um, we've had protests on the street, just holding signs, saying bans our homes too. Um, we haven't done any like direct action, so to speak, but actually because things have gone, yeah, they're, they've just, they're just pushing us out in every manner possible. Um, even the campground can't have their people that live in vehicles stay in the campground anymore. So even the like, so yeah, so I think the next step for us is, kind of um, like a right to remain movements. We're gonna, <laughs> hoping to rally a guy with a truck to move a concrete block to take back um, a piece of land that is not in the district's, it's in the district's jurisdiction, but it's uh, it's BC um, Hydro. So it's a um, corporation run. So planning to take that little spot back since that was um, used, re used by vehicle residents. Um, we do community cleanups um, to help gather like to help just give us a better reputation um but yeah i think yeah i think the next steps i mean i really don't have any faith that the council here is going to do anything for us there's so much real estate speculation and it's just gentrifying and the demographics have changed quite a lot to very affluent people um but yeah community um like we might host a community movement like come and meet your vehicle resident in the park someday but to me i think the what we have to do is just park in front of city hall and not move until they do something, even though the not moving is not what we want to do. I want to be able to move. So yeah, I think more aggressive um, claim your space uh, is what we're going to be trying to do next. Um, yeah. Which will cause problems, but uh, we need, they need to do They need to do something inclusive for us. We can't keep pushing people out. Thank you, Thomasina. So a few things that I heard in terms of tactics that could um, advance organizing goals um, are uh, showing up to city council events, doing outreach and, and getting people to show up. And you can, it sounds like, you know, get good numbers, but be mindful of sustaining interest because people will become fatigued as they don't see the change that they're organizing for. Um, so, you know, that's that's one tactic. Um, and a thing to be mindful of. There are also events, for example, you mentioned cleanups, you know, to build uh, community connection and to build, you know, positive branding for, for people who are engaged in the cleanups. That also, I think, can play a, a role um, as well. And I thank you for highlighting that, Thomasina. And then a third is direct action, like, for example, seizing um, some property and, and staying there until, um, until you're taken seriously. Um, and uh, there are policies that um, may not exist in your area now, um, but that there are some potential templates for to establish something like a right to remain. Um, specifically, I'd, I'd call out, um, and it was not successful in the United States, but there um, are policies that were considered um, by the state of Oregon, the state of California, and the state of Colorado, all of which were called the Right to Rest Act, um, which looks like a right to remain. Um, and you can find information about that those policy efforts as well as you know helpful materials like the template language on the Western Regional Advocacy Project website and I'll make sure that I uh, put that into the chat. Uh, one more one more person I'd like to call about organizing before we move on to the questions in the chat is uh, Thomas Knight. Uh, Thomas, I saw your hand go up and I'm wondering if you can talk at all about what it looks like in the Bay Area. Yeah, well, I can tell you, so I'm a member of the Lived Experience Advisory Board of Silicon Valley. So we're a board of 38 um, people who have lived experience of homelessness. 
um, some current and some past, um, you know, but we work a lot with uh, nonprofit partners all over um, the Bay Area here in order to fight against criminalization. Um, some of those nonprofits have, um, you know, direct um, and specific um, efforts right now towards um, making sure that that criminalization um, doesn't happen. And unfortunately, we have a mayor here in San Jose who um, is is more pro criminalization than we would like. So um, we spend a lot of time at city hall and uh, county supervisors meetings, trying to make sure that, that those things don't go through. Um, unfortunately, like you see in a lot of places, you know, even going to city council, um, you know, we find that their, their, their minds are already made up no matter what public comment says. Um, but we find in those cases, meeting with them directly um, before the meetings and having conversations with them is more useful than public comment itself. Thank you, Thomas. And he didn't raise his hand, but at the risk of uh, annoying him and and also um, being annoying to the rest of you, because I'm only now turning to the uh, criminalization questions in the chat. I, I'm wondering if we can hear from Bill Sweeney, who is an experienced attorney, um, policy advocate, a service provider, and living in uh, Colorado, where um, organizing has made some difference. I mean, there are, in a lot of ways in Denver and Boulder, there are um, policies that the rest of us would like to emulate. Thank you. Um... There's, there's a lot going on, and I, I think we have moved in a somewhat different direction. There's um, the classic idea that somehow uh, we learned in civics class that uh, well-intentioned people would go and give a nice speech that sounded good in a 1930s movie. And, um, the mayor and the city council would say, oh, my gosh, you know, we, we really need to think this through. And they would adopt a bill whose language was magically printed somewhere behind the scenes in Hollywood. Uh, that doesn't happen, or at least it's over here. Um, most things that are political theater are useful only for stopping, uh, not for getting what you want. They're only good for stopping uh, because they, they make people afraid to take a position. Uh, that's what they're designed to do. And there's a lot of frustration because the system doesn't work the way civics class said it would. Um, it works if you start at the grassroots, but that means uh, there are candidates we've been backing for a decade or more um, who are now coming into maturity of their offices, who are beginning to do the things that we need to do and who are listening to us. Yes, we need to meet with them before every vote that has any kind of meeting um, I regularly brief individually the city council members, the county commissioners on important issues, uh, just the way they ask their staffs to brief them. I send them regular briefings two or three times a year telling them what they need to do. So does my daughter. We have, I can't tell you how many lawsuits and civil proceedings and the like outstanding. Um, it is not... Uh, it's not an arena for the faint of heart or for those who just want to drop in and get a change and drop out again. It's That doesn't really happen very often. Uh, it's a long-term game, and the people that you're trying to talk to mostly are concerned primarily with essentially the retention of power. Uh, and they are not really terribly concerned um, with the outcome of issues. That is issue politics is mostly over and it's mostly power politics now and that's if that's the case um you have to be able to turn out a lot of voters and you have to follow politicians for a long time and uh, be part of their uh, understanding of where their support is thank you bill so you know that's that's another uh type of strategy uh that we should all be mindful of, you know, you can organize um, voter turnout in order to support different policies, but then there's also uh, concerted long-term organized efforts to do policy advocacy. And that can include um, backing 
particular candidates to install them into seats of power, supporting them um, as they come up for election, um, you know, election cycle after election cycle, developing relationships with them so that you're meeting with them and educating them about what their vote can and should be given you, your particular expertise and insight and connection into the constituency that you're representing through that that conversation and as bill mentioned you know this can pay off dividends over some period of time as those um candidates become um senior office holders and it can start you know wielding real power so, you know, in the interest of time, let's uh, go ahead and transition over to some of the issues in the chat. Thank you very much, Ruth, for putting, uh, you know, uh, the public health resource there in the chat. I see that Amanda um, references what unfortunately is a really common type of criminalization policy um, in Sarasota, laws that um, prohibit the, the postures of sitting or lying down in public spaces. Um, as with so many communities, shelters cost um, some amount of money um, each day, $12 a day to anyone who stays there. Of course, that's a barrier. Um, they ticket people um, with fines if they sit or lie down, which means people have to continuously keep moving. And uh, policymakers have been getting away with it. And the question is, would Johnson v. Grants Pass undo such laws? Um, and the answer is um, not necessarily. So uh, the Johnson case dealt with when it was filed, a uh, patchwork of ordinances in the city of Grants Pass, Oregon. And there were a lot of different uh, constitutionally based claims that were included in the original lawsuit. The only thing that is pending before the Supreme Court right now is whether a community can enforce a generally applicable, setting aside that that's a, a legal fiction, but a generally applicable, at least on its face, camping ordinance against people who have no access to shelter or housing. And whether enforcement in that circumstance would violate the Eighth Amendment's Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause. So this is to say that a bad decision in the uh, Johnson case will have consequences. And I think um, the reality is it's going to embolden um, governments, including local governments, to enforce criminalization policies, even when um, they know that people don't have alternatives. In some communities, that won't actually change the landscape much. That's already happened um, because they know that people don't have access to lawyers and a real opportunity to push back. In some communities, that could mean uh, enforcement of currently existing ordinances like sit-lie laws. Um, it might mean uh, enactment of, of new ordinances um, that they feel that they have a, a green light to move forward. But again, Johnson would only be um, narrowly about camping bans and the Eighth Amendment's Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause. So there still would be a lot of different tools that would be available to unhoused people to challenge a sit-lie ban. Now, having said all that, because that sounds a little bit positive and I don't wanna leave people with a false sense of positivity, sit-lie bans have not been successfully challenged. Um, even before the Supreme Court has anything to say about Johnson, sit-lie bans are really difficult to challenge um, for a number of different reasons. Um, one of them being that they often don't apply throughout an entire community. So to the extent that Sarasota says you cannot sit or lie down in public space anywhere at any time in the city of Sarasota, um, that it would be vulnerable to a number of different arguments um, that uh, I think, despite what happens in Johnson, um, it, it would still be vulnerable to those arguments. If it is you can't sit or lie down in the downtown business core during business hours, that's a lot harder to challenge. And some communities have not been able to successfully challenge laws that are restricted in that way. Um, there's a, a case out of Seattle um, that found that does not uh, punish a person for lacking any place to sit or lie down because you don't need to be in the downtown business core during business hours. Bill, did I see you come off of mute? Yes, I did. Wanted to toss in something else here because it's there's 
there is a political movement. It's um, more international than national. Uh, and it um, revolves around determining whether or not it's possible to get jurisdictions to add persons who are unhoused to the list of legally protected classes. There are a whole lot of things that are happening in different jurisdictions. Uh, many cities, many states have local um, laws that model on uh, the restrictive laws of the United States over race and sex and disability and the like. And uh, if there were a similar classification for people based on their housing status, uh, there might be a lot that could be done. Um, I've been working on that for quite a few years here. It's uh, a long slog, uh, but it may be uh, worth considering as a uh, an additional strategy. Thank you, Bill. And you know, for those who um, who might benefit from some context for what uh, Bill's talking about, what there are certain um, identities that are deemed uh, protected statuses or protected classes. And that uh, means a couple things. One, discrimination based on a protected identity is unlawful under uh, federal and um, a lot of state policies. So, and, and potentially some local policies as well. So there's this protection against discrimination. There also is a heightened level of judicial scrutiny whenever uh, discrimination is fairly alleged. This is something that looks neutral on its face, like let's say a, a sit lie ban that has a discriminatory impact on somebody with a protected status. And when a status is expressly protected, judges will apply heightened scrutiny, meaning you have a higher standard of uh of proof as a city that you have a non-discriminatory purpose for enacting and enforcing that particular policy when it impacts people who are members of protected classes. I hope that wasn't too kind of legal easy, but suffice it to say, there's a lot more protection um, and it's a lot harder to justify those uh, discriminatory laws in courts when um, they're is um, clear protection of people based on a protected identity. The Supreme Court has said that a person's um, housing status, uh, well, the Supreme Court has said that housing is not a fundamental right. Um, and so we don't um, have any um, constitutional right to adequate housing. Uh, the Supreme Court has also said that uh, a person's um, socioeconomic status uh, is not uh, protected. And so what that means, uh, as a practical matter is that it is often legal to discriminate against somebody based on their economic status. There are efforts like Bill has described to uh, write in expressly to laws protection for people based on their socioeconomic status or perhaps their housing status or form of shelter that they use. And uh, that would provide some legal protection against um, discrimination and enforcement of laws like a sit lie law that have a discriminatory impact on people who don't have private places to sit down in Sarasota, for example. Okay, so moving right along to the next, uh, just because we're at 309 and I know that we wanna cover uh, different comments. The state mandate to build more housing has created a huge increase in real estate influence and city affairs. Most open space in Berkeley is slated for development um, or both market rate and affordable housing. Um, and I'm going to assume, Bob, that um, the affordable housing you're referring to is housing that is at 80% area median income or below, which in a place like Berkeley is an incredibly uh, large amount of money because uh, the median income uh, is is quite high um, given you know the industry that's in the Bay Area. And the available space for vehicle residents is shrinking as the need increases. Uh, here, here, Bob, uh, I I don't know that any of us in kind of major urban areas are experiencing anything different uh, as it relates to the um, 
development and gentrification of, of spaces. And it does create a shrinking of locations where vehicle residents can be. Um, before I move on to what Thomasina said, I'll just name that one of the barriers to solutions is the difficulty in finding adequate sites for locations where people can be. Um, for this very reason, uh, you know, a lot of the more prime real estate is being developed um, for profit. Um, the type of sites that we're talking about for vehicle residents are not as profitable as high end, uh, you know, condos. And uh, what is left in terms of available land for those types of sites may not be appropriate at all for human habitation. Um, like, for example, sites that I have seen identified in different locations that are former, you know, toxic, toxic waste sites, you know, people want a place to be, but they should not be and cannot be um, health, healthfully and safely placed in a location that is is not adequate for them. And so as you start to think about advocacy for places where people can be, um, you know, be mindful of some of the uh, zoning um, regulations, the housing planning, um, and other types of um, policies that may uh, dictate appropriate sites for the types of communities that, that Ruth mentioned. So can, can next. One thing too? Yes, please. And I just want to say, because of this this new uh, mandate by the state, the amount of money that's coming into the city as a result of the development is really influencing our city council. It's just it's it's heartbreaking to see the change. And you know, it's it's a well intended law that is really has had some pretty uh, pretty uh, devastating uh, consequences. Bob, has there been any um, discussion of including um, sim similar to like an inclusionary zoning policy, like including um, funding for safe parking or for um, affordable housing that is um, a prerequisite to Berkeley approving the development? Currently, there isn't. No, we... Uh, we, uh, the organization I'm with operated a safe parking program um, at a site that is now under development. And so we, we had to leave. We had 40 vehicles parked there for about a little over a year. And, uh, and uh, because of development, uh, everybody had to be relocated to nowhere <laughs> <laughs> or anywhere. Yeah. You know, a, a, thing to look at and potentially to organize for is a requirement that especially in places like Berkeley where that will just about always attract um, you know development because it is such a desirable location in the United States to be um, that uh, a an ask from vehicle residents in addition to a place is that there be no approval of um, permits for building without um, including um, funding for safe parking or um, a plan for where people living in vehicles can safely and permanently park. And there are different types of um, ways to go about that. In uh, California, we have a, a law, a state law that requires every community to come up with a housing plan that's called the housing element. There's some um, oversight done by the state. You can look to that plan advocate with the you know planning commission or the zoning boards as you think about how to um, you know leverage to the fullest extent possible mandates that there be places where people can be and uh, requirements uh, to provide funding for um, development of those locations um, from wealthy developers who are uh, looking to to build. Yeah, they are currently required to to provide offsets for affordable housing, but again, most of that money goes to technically affordable, but practically unaffordable. Yeah, uh, it's it's really too bad that affordable housing is defined in the way that it is, and maybe that's another you know policy um, change that needs to be made. Is uh, if affordable housing is eighty percent area median income in a location where that may be? Burke, uh, do you happen to know what eighty percent area median income is, Bob? Is it like one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year? Uh, in that range, yes. 
it's it's somewhere around there because that's that's about what it is in Santa Clara County. Uh, that is not affordable housing, and it's certainly not affordable to the people earning 30 percent area median income or lower who are um, our low income renters and unhoused people and many of our vehicle residents. Betsy, I see your hand up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I live around the corner from Bob. I'm one of his biggest fans. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, the tools you're mentioning were once thought to be really helpful, but I those are like decades and they still haven't. Uh, so I, I, I want to draw attention to what I think we could also, those of us who have the patience and the time, which is housing justice organizing, not just advocating for generic affordable housing, but uh, going more deeply into renters' rights. And I wanted to draw attention uh, that, you know, it's the evidence is that it's the rent, not any particular characteristics of people, but which of course we know contributes to all sorts of things in our lives. But the rents going up without rent control and untrammeled eviction laws that allow, uh, you know, the rents cause people to go onto the streets. And and I just wanted to say, I think there's some newer uh, tools. One of them is Alliance for Housing Justice seems to be a new uh, national alliance of groups like Right to the City some of the low-income poverty law centers, uh, some think tanks, uh, you know, that they're actually looking at building, base building. These groups may already have organizing going on, but they're not organizing people who are unhoused because that is a very special and unique and moves around kind of, um, you know, it's people here. So you, you tell me. Um, but I just think knowing a little more about the structures uh, will be helpful. And yes, we have lots of laws in Berkeley and even the state that still don't necessarily include or give space to what you said. Having, having a, a platform for right to park, right to have safe parking, things that uh, you're denied once you're no longer paying your property taxes in an area, apparently. So I just want to reinforce, I put a couple links of just two, two things that I know, and I really recommend this collaborative consider joining, not to be the voice of vehicle residents, but to bring that voice to the table because we need it to really have a robust housing for all response. So anyway, thank you. I I, I just know we're very frustrated in Berkeley <laughs> and that uh, uh, organizing, 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 building relationships. I really appreciate that message. Yeah, I, I agree. So a couple things I, I want to lift up. Um, organizing uh, should not be thought of narrowly as just um, finding locations where people who are living in vehicles can be. As we know, a lot of people um, want to remain living in their vehicles. Many are living in their vehicles as a function of having been displaced from traditional forms of housing, often rental housing, often as a direct result be, uh, of, of eviction or threat of eviction because people can't afford to pay the rent. Um, when you think about homelessness prevention and when you think about uh, ways to prevent people from being displaced from housing, rent control policies and organizing for that can help build a broad tent um, of, of groups that can all work for a common purpose to reduce the number of people who are um, being displaced from housing. Uh, also, uh, we're at we're at time, so um, I think it is correct that uh, we keep pushing on the traditional levers, but thinking about other um, you know policy advocacy levers. We haven't talked a lot about litigation. Another strategy is to um, file lawsuits. We are. Let's see, are folks comfortable? Because I know that this goes to 3.30 and we're just about we're just about at the time when they would want us to wrap up because we want to take a 15 minute break. But I'd, I'd like to keep going. Um, so I'm, I'll stay on for anybody who wants to, to keep going so we can keep going through. Great. 
Um, so let's let's transition and talk about uh, litigation. And I'm just going through here to see uh, if there are any questions specific to litigation. Thank you, Betsy, for putting those resources in the chat. And thank you also for highlighting what is most critical. Ultimately, if you're not a vehicle resident, um, all you can do is be an ally to vehicle residents. And that means uh, assisting vehicle residents for telling their stories, supporting their goals. Um, but we're not we're not the people who tell the narratives. We can't be the narrative builders. Uh, we should not be the people who are um, attempting to um, control the direction of advocacy. That should be, you know, community driven, and uh, that includes with litigation strategies. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about what it means to to litigate. There are ordinances that are vulnerable to legal challenge. Often criminalization policies are challenged based on violating the U.S. Constitution. A lot of those cases are brought in federal court. Not all of them are. All of our states have constitutions as well. Our states usually have some form of analogous right to the rights that we recognize under the U.S. Constitution, like a right to be free from unreasonable seizures, a right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. So under your state constitution, you can also look for um, a basis to file claims um, against the types of policies and enforcement practices that characterize you know, criminalization of vehicle residency um, ordinances. A thing to recognize, though, is that uh, litigation is prolonged. You know, it, it can take years. The Bloom v. San Diego case that I mentioned yesterday, that was filed in 2017. And we are just about ready to file our, you know, motion for final approval of the settlement agreement. And we're mid-2024. We won't have, you know, any real decision about that, even for a few more months. And so I say this to say litigation can be a, a really powerful tool, but it's one that takes a long time. Um, and it takes a lot of investment for all of the named plaintiffs who are part of that law lawsuit. They showed up um, for deposition. They had to show up for hearings. They showed up for settlement negotiations. There's a lot of, um, you know, resource investment. But when you have that commitment, it can result in large packages of relief like the one um, that uh, we believe will be approved in San Diego. But again, using San Diego as uh, as an example, um, the relief is imperfect. It's a compromise because it's a settlement agreement. You know, Desert Train, the case that's being referenced in the chat by Peggy, that resulted in an opinion that a particular type of ordinance was vague. That's great for striking down that ordinance. What ended up happening? Just, you know, replacement and other forms of um, ordinances. I don't say this to discourage us, but I do say this to, to say that um, there is no silver bullet tactic. There um, needs to be prolonged um, commitment to the tactics that you use. And that includes ones that people think of as, as being a silver bullet like litigation. Yes, Peggy. Um, I think people have a hard time finding attorneys. And part of the situation is, is that it takes years and the people have no money to pay the attorney. So it has to be taken on by uh, pro bono. So I know this from working with Carol Sobel in the Desert Train case and other cases, you know, and people get mad as an activist that, I, oh, get your attorney, Peggy. But they don't understand that, you know, I mean, she's not that young anymore. And where are all of the attorneys willing to spend years and years not getting paid and then getting criticized when they do get paid? after five, seven years of fighting and the city not, you know, even wanted to pay at that point, even though they've lost. It's a crazy situation when you have an evil municipality. So I would say that, uh, you know, we need to combine our litigation with other activism and really support each other. That's just my feeling about litigation that, you know, we can't expect lawyers to be the silver bullet and come and save us. We have to do the work, too, as organizers and activists to bring the evidence. Right. And hopefully it's a good case. I don't know. So um, I really support uh, litigation, though. <laughs> I do. Yeah, thank you. I see that Graham's here probably to warn us that we're going way over time. But I, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, <laughs> wrap it up to say um, that. 
we talked about organizing strategies. We talked about different types of policy advocacy and political strategies. And we talked about, uh, at the end, litigation strategies. We do need more lawyers. And there is a way to um, marry the idea of movements with lawyering. Um, please do check out the National Homelessness Law Center and RAPS legal defense clinic model. There are um, resources that have been put together that can assist um, with the type of movement lawyering that this larger movement needs. Um, and you can implement those resources locally. And I'm I'm always happy as a person who helped develop those resources, um, you know, to talk about them and, and support them. Thank you all for staying over and um, for as uh, rich conversation as we could get in 45 minutes.